common man in the tort. Mike Rigardotti, Scott Torgerson. So happy you've tuned in. Tell a friend. Draft heavy, all football all the time. Lots of trades in the first round. Browns trading up to three to get Trent Richardson. They then take Brandon Whedon at 22. We go up to Cleveland, talk to our guy, Browns insider. Andre Knott joins us on the Frontier Communications fan hotline. Andre, keep him busy. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you guys as well. Uh, the holiday started well in Cleveland, or for some, but it uh, at least started with some stuff that makes people uh, want to talk and are interested in Browns football again. So you were at the facilities last night when all this stuff was going down. What was the overall mood around the guys last night? Well, it's funny because about 45 minutes before the first trade, the trade went down, uh, I sat down with Tom Hecker and I did an interview with him that I was going to run 45 minutes later. And I brought up, you know, there was a lot of talk going on about trading up to that three, you know, to that three spot for Trent Richardson. And he kind of said to me, he goes, I'm well aware of what's being said, but he goes, I think we're going to get our guy. And obviously he knew that, you know, the Tampa Bay was going to try their hardest to get there. And he made the move. And I think a lot of, a lot of things last night were planted when RG3 or the choice to draft RG3 went down about a month and a half ago. And a lot of people in Cleveland kind of felt like the Browns were at sleep, were asleep and weren't aggressive enough to go out there RG3. I think because of what happened between St. Louis, Washington, and Cleveland a month ago, that made the Browns be progressive. That made them go ahead and make this move. Uh, and I think this part of the reason why they, took, they uh, selected Brandon Whedon as well. Uh, so I think the reaction for most in Cleveland was uh, not a surprise, but kind of a, yeah, a little bit of a surprise but more of a it's about time they did something that makes sense. Well, there's a lot of people who feel that Rick Spielman bluffed the Browns, that they wanted Matt Khalil the entire time. The Browns gave up a 4, 5, and 7 to move one spot when they'd probably get Trent Richardson that pick anyway. What's the feeling about trading those picks up in Cleveland? I think you have to look at the whole situation. And I, you know, and I, and I get the question because while I was on the air while this was going on, that was a speculation that you had. But now that you go through the first round and you see all the, the trades that were made, I think it was a legitimate move to be made. And I think they were ahead of the curve in trusting. And, I, and as I said, I go back to the deal with St. Louis uh, in Washington. I think a lot of they probably didn't buy into how much the, the Redskins were willing to give up. Uh, and I think they felt like they were burned on it. And they weren't going to let that happen again. And as I said, if you look at all the moves that were made in the first round, the Browns knew that there was going to be movement throughout this draft. And that's why they did it early. And I think I commend them for it because – as I said, I feel like the wolves pulled over their eyes a month ago in the RG3 situation. Andre Knott, Browns insider, joining us here on The Fan. I, I have said that I don't, I don't like Brandon Whedon at 22. That's just my own personal preference. Everything that I'm hearing, though, Andre, is that the Browns were ready to go Kendall Wright, and then he went off the board, and it's almost like they changed the entire future of their franchise in a 10, 15-minute time span. Did, have you heard the same thing, that they were high on Kendall Wright, and that's who their guy Absolutely. was? Yeah, absolutely. Kendall Wright was their guy. I mean, was their guy. And, and I think I think what you have to look at, they were going to try to get Brandon Whedon regardless. And I think they were worried about Green Bay. And, and I knew that they – I was told before the draft they weren't going to use all 13 selections. Obviously, they moved three of them to get Richardson. They weren't, weren't afraid to move up again. Uh, and I think when Kendall Wright went off the board, I think they told themselves – and they, and Tom Hecker basically told me this last night – because I'm going to be aggressive and get the guy I want. And I think the other thing that plays into it, the other positions of need that they have going into today's draft, offensive lineman and wide receiver, I think they look at the guys like Stephen Hill, uh, Reuben Randall, uh, and some of those guys, they don't look at them as as, as as high prospects as they do as Brandon Whedon. Uh, and I think they felt like after after Brandon Whedon, there wasn't a quarterback they really wanted in this draft that they felt they could play this year. I think really taking Brandon, and, and I'm with you, to be honest, I thought Brandon Whedon was a little high for 22. After talking to them, I think and this really should, takes more of a, a picture on what they really think about Colt McCoy. They didn't want to have Colt McCoy underneath them as their starting quarterback anymore, and I think that was part of the reason why they did this. The other thing is, and this may blow you away because it blew me away, and I tweeted this last night, I was told by Tom Heckard that he had Brandon Whedon as the 13th-rated guy on their draft board. Wow. Hey, I want to ask you about Colt McCoy. A lot of rumblings that Green Bay will take him as a backup. What's the and I really don't believe Monday he's going to be a member of the organization. But what's the going rate for Colt McCoy? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think we, I was I was wondering the same thing. I just left the facility and Pat Shermer basically told me at this point in time that they have had no conversations about trading 
uh, Colt McCoy. Now, you know, we can look at that however we want, but that's what he said. At this moment, they haven't. I think over the next 24 hours, there will be some talk. Uh, it's hard to say what it'll, it'll be worth when you consider uh, Asante Samuel basically got moved from Philadelphia to Atlanta for a seventh-round pick. Now, obviously, he's an older player, and he has a contract that's much bigger. Uh, I'm thinking if it is Green Bay, I think they have three seven-rounders, and they have two second six-rounders, I believe. I would think maybe a six-rounder or a seventh-rounder maybe for Colt McCoy. But at quarterback, you may be able to get a five, I guess. Andre Knott, Browns insider, joining us here on The Fan. Now, I know that they have Seneca Wallace there, but – you know, Colt McCoy is not exactly like Tim Tebow here. The distraction of having Colt McCoy around is not going to stop the presses. So why wouldn't they consider just keeping him around as a good backup quarterback? Uh, that's a great question. I think I think I, I keep going back to when you make continuous moves in the offseason to get quarterbacks. I think it tells you what they really think of him long term. Uh, I think I think some team. I think the one thing that happened when when Mike Holmgren came here, he said we will not deal with quarterback controversies anymore. If you remember, he came in after the Brady Quinn, Derek Anderson, uh, and he, you know, and, and Eric Mangini tried to handle it, didn't handle it well. And I know that one of the things that Holmgren and Hecker said is they won't have those. They're not going to let people go back and forth and with quarterbacks. Yeah, you're right. He could be a backup, but what if he's a, a malcontent? I mean, there's already things out there that he was said that he was told uh, that you know Adam Schefter reported that he said he was told that they weren't going to use a court pick for a quarterback in the first round. I know that I've heard that that didn't make the, the people within Berea very happy because they never told Colt McCoy that. I just think a lot of those things, uh, just kind of some of the things that have come out in the media now, at the same time, Colt has come out to another person in the media and said he never said that. So I think when you keep getting those type of situations that occur with him, uh, I think some at some point in time they may to be to the point of good riddance rather than anything else. Andre, uh, two-parter for you here. Second round, where do they go, offensive line or wide receiver? And is and I love Janoris Jenkins. I know there's the off-the-field stuff. But on the field, I felt when he played with Joe Hayden, he was the better of the two at Florida. Is who? Where do they go in the second round? And is Janoris Jenkins totally off their board? I totally agree with everything you said about when they him and Hayden played together. I've had a scout from Florida tell me that as well. Uh, I, you know, if they're really ready, if they really – I think they're – here's the thing I'll say. I think they're going to take two second-round picks today. I don't know how. I just have a feeling that because of the players that are still on the board, uh, they're going to move more picks. He, and, they, and Tom Hecker told me last night, he goes, I was aggressive you know, Thursday night, and I plan on being aggressive again Friday. I think he's going to make a move to try to get more than one guy – I think you got to play off St. Louis. Let's say St. Louis starts this draft off and they take one of the tackles. I think that may force the hand of the Browns. Let's say that St. Louis, because St. Louis has to take offense today, and they have three picks. If St. Louis goes out and let's say they take Reuben Randall or Stephen Hill, I think the other guy will be the guy that the Browns will go with with the fifth pick. Uh, I think but you still have Jonathan Martin out there, the tackle from Stanford. Uh, there's a couple other. There's a couple. There's, uh, Bobby Massey is a guy that the Browns like a lot as well out of Old Miss. Uh, and then the Janoris Jenkins thing. You know, last season, two players, the first two players that Brown selected had some character issues. Not bad ones. Phil Taylor got into a fight in, at Penn State and was kicked out. Ended up having to tra- trade, you know, had to transfer to Baylor. Uh, but they did their homework and said they had no problem with it, didn't have a problem with him. Jabal Sheard, uh, the defensive end out of Pitt, had a situation where I want to say he threw a guy through a glass window at Pitt, and they were able to look past that. I know Janoris Jenkins' problems are a little bit, you know, a little bit more high classified. But I wouldn't be surprised if they took a risk on him because I understand the way Tom Hecker looks at it, cornerback's one of the most important positions on the defensive backfield, in the field. Andre, I always appreciate it, buddy. We'll talk soon. Good stuff. Take care, guys. Have a good one. Andre Knott, Browns insider, joins us on the Frontier Communications fan hotline.